Uh, welcome. Please, we, we do need to get started because the chairman has a, has a hearing this afternoon. He's going to have to race out of the door here at 2.30 and we want to give you the maximum amount of time to be able to interact with him. And I'm just very, very grateful that he would take the time to be with us. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president of CSIS. When we have groups like this, outside groups, we always start with a little safety announcement. Matt Goodman's in charge of your safety. We'll make sure everybody's well. That door right there is the one closest to the street exit will go down two floors. We'll take two left-hand turns and a right turn. We'll go over to National Geographic and I'll pay for everybody to go see the Titanic exhibit. It's really terrific. It's a great, great, great show. Um, Chairman Hensling, thank you. We're delighted that you would be here today. He was a leader on probably one of the most important new pieces of legislation about industrial security we've had in a long time. I worked on the staff of the Armed Services, Senate Armed Services Committee back when we passed Exxon Florio, which was, of course, the start for CFIUS, and that had a very narrow definition of national security. And what the chairman and other leaders in the Congress have been wrestling with is how do we have to adapt that in this new, much more global, modern world? And it's a much bigger, much more complicated picture, and they have really come up with very important landmark legislation. We're going to have a chance to listen to him talk about it. Let me turn to you, Matt. You're going to actually introduce the chairman. Thank you all for coming. We're glad to have you here. Thanks, Dr. Henry. Appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to CSIS. Welcome to our online viewers. We always have a good, uh, a good crowd of people watching us online. Delighted to have you as well. Um, uh, if, if everybody could just uh, mute their phones, we'd appreciate it uh, so we don't disrupt the, uh, the proceedings. Um, let me thank uh, for helping to um, make this event possible the embassies of Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, and New Zealand, all of whom have been uh, working with us uh, to discuss these issues of foreign investment, uh, to share um, uh, observations and uh, concerns, and talk about policy responses. We've been working on this in the Simon Chair uh, here at CSIS. Did I say who I am? Matt Goodman. Uh, I, I hold the Simon Chair here in political economy at CSAS. Um, we've been working on this for the, the past year following the developments in, uh, in the legislative side of this story as well as in the actual uh, market and seeing what uh, foreign investment trends have been. Um, so we're delighted to be able to organize this event and to um, have uh, n not only, I'm going to just quickly do the run of show. I'm about to introduce Congressman Henseling. Then we will have a panel with some terrific experts uh, for about an hour and a half, and then with, uh, we will move straight into our closing keynote, which is Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Heath Tarbert, who's the one who has to implement uh, FIRMA uh, at the end. There will be no breaks uh, throughout, but uh, we don't want to torture you. If you need to leave, you can. Uh, there are restrooms behind us here, and there's going to be coffee up on the, um, up on the Sam Nunn Terrace. And uh, we will have a reception at the end at 4.30. So that's the incentive to stay, uh, or the trade-off for, uh, for no breaks. Um, so uh, again, we're very interested in this topic of this. Uh, I'm going to say it once, and then we'll, we'll say FIRMA uh, hereafter. The Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, which is this landmark piece of legislation to uh, strike a balance between ensuring uh, protection of our national security uh, with keeping our open investment uh, climate in the United States, which is also critical to our uh, well-being. So getting that balance right is really what FIRMA is all about. Um, and we're just delighted to have one of the authors of this legislation, uh, uh, Congressman Jeb Henseling of Texas. Um, he's been in Congress since 2003, uh, so this is his eighth term. He represents Texas, uh, Texas's fifth congressional district. Uh, he's chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, where he's been involved with um, uh, uh, passing um, or leading uh, the passage of several key pieces of legislation um, and was uh, instrumental in, in getting uh, FIRMA across the line uh, and maintaining that important balance between uh, national security and an open investment climate. Uh, so we're just delighted that he was willing to come here and give us his perspectives on this piece of legislation. He's going to speak for about 15 minutes, then we'll sit for as long as he can stay, which is not long because he has to rush back to the Hill, uh, and we'll take a couple of questions if we can. So with that, Congressman Henseling. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for being here today, although I'm not sure what to think when the uh, 
first organizer points to the exit and the second organizer points to the coffee. I'm not sure what that says about the quality of the remarks I'm about to uh, make, but nonetheless, I thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in the topic. Uh, I appreciated the opportunity to work with a number of good friends on a very important piece of legislation. Uh, one was Senator John Cornyn, my fellow Texan, who I had the pleasure of knowing since 1984, which is looking at the audience is probably before at least a couple of you were even born. So I appreciated the opportunity to work with him uh, and my friend Robert Pittenger, who carried this legislation in the House as well as Andy Barr of Kentucky, who was the chairman of our relevant subcommittee, who also helped carry this through the, um, through the House. Their leadership was ex uh, absolutely instrumental in coming up with the firma that was actually put onto the president's desk. So I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you a little bit about how we got here and what we might expect going forward as this important legislation is actually implemented. So after the last year, the House Financial Services Committee, which I chair, held no less than four different hearings on the topic, which frankly, by our standards, is fairly hearing heavy, but it was an important topic. Other committees uh, of jurisdiction uh, also held relevant hearings. It's no secret then for those of you who actually followed FIRMA, you then know that it evolved considerably from the first iteration to what was actually presented to President Trump for his signature as part of the NDAA. I would also say, uh, perhaps a little provincially, that the House approached the bill, I dare say, a little bit more cautiously uh, than the Senate did. Our committee, and frankly on both sides of the aisle, were constantly uh, alert, perhaps vigilant, about unintended consequences for America's investment climate. Having served in Congress for almost 16 years now, I can tell you if there's one thing Congress excels at, it is unintended consequences. We therefore wish to minimize their impact. Uh, because we also know that at the end of the day, foreign direct investment is part of national wealth. And national wealth uh, and economic growth is part and parcel of national security. So we also just wanted to make sure that not only were there not unintended consequences, but we also wanted to work to ensure uh, that the law could not be abused abused by future administrations as a potential tool of industrial policy, protectionism, or economic control. So I'm happy to report to you um, that many of the House's priorities were contained in the final provisions that were signed into law by President Trump. Now, although, as you most likely know, FIRMA does expand CFIUS's purview, including for certain minority investments and real estate deals, but I believe some of the more astute analysis of the legislation has noted that a number of FIRMA's changes are, in fact, incremental, which is what we on the House side intended them to be. For example, providing CFIUS with measured authorities, uh, it may need at the margins or codifying practices that were in many respects already in place while devoting increased attention to resource needs and indeed that is a significant issue. Uh, we believe on the House side that clearly we struck the proper balance uh, even though some have advocated for something that was far more transformative than what ultimately was signed into law. Let me speak briefly now about how we thought about FIRMA in principle, because it may help explain how some of the changes uh, in the first iteration of the bill uh, took place and why they took place. Um, and also what we kind of want to see is the rules are drafted in the implementation of this. And when I say we, I'm principally referring to, again, the House side um, and, and members of both sides of the aisle. It is, frankly, a fairly rare occurrence, but in this particular case, my ranking member, Maxine Waters, uh, and myself uh, had similar views on this legislation. 
Uh, and it was, again, an area of, of total bipartisanship on both our committee and in the House. And uh, the senior leadership of the committee on both sides of the aisle need to be congratulated for their thoughtfulness as they approach the issue. Um, one of my favorite quotes as a legislator is a quote from Jefferson. How can you go wrong in quoting Jefferson? The ground of liberty is to be gained in inches. I use that quote often. And I guess the corollary is if you are going to then yield liberty, it should only be yielded in inches and only for the purpose of our national safety and security. So although our committee understood that certain trade-offs would clearly be necessary in any type of update or reform or modernization of CFIUS, we were very, very skeptical as we approach this exercise of any investment restrictions or frankly the potential for such restrictions beyond what was absolutely essential for national security. And even where extra authorities for CFIUS were judged necessary, we were careful to circumscribe them and insert stipulations um, and oversight provisions that will allow Congress uh, and frankly outside parties to challenge any abuses or overreach. Uh, and oh, by the way, we did hear objections and pushback along the way to our approach. Um, there were some, shall we say, vigorous discussions along the way. We were told that any additional powers that even if they were granted in FIRMA surely would be uncontroversial and they would never be exploited by CFIUS in practice. Another quote of President Reagan, trust but verify. We also heard that even if those powers were misused, that a future Congress could always claw them back. If you have followed any of the trade discussions on Section 232, uh, and if you believe, as I do, that my 11-year-old gray Honda Accord is not a threat to national security, you can understand why we were a little skeptical of the pushback we received. I won't go any further into the trade context here, but needless to say, it helped calibrate my comfort level when thinking about how broad FIRMA should be. I want to be very explicit about this point. As originally drafted, FIRMA likely would have represented the single largest expansion of executive authority over foreign commerce in decades, both with respect to inbound and outbound investments. Even going into conference negotiations, there were provisions in play that would have been no less open to abuse than Section 232 is or other emergency powers that can be wielded by a U.S. president. Now, while a number of stakeholders, I think, appreciated the gravity uh, of this, it remains unclear whether some in the private sector truly appreciated and recognized what was at stake in this bill, uh, even though they otherwise were vocal supporters of vigorous free trade and foreign direct investment. I would also in strongly encourage all those parties uh, to remain vigilant and vigorous and active as the administration proceeds to implement FIRMA. Indeed, the devil remains in the details. If we could, let's turn to the bill itself. Almost from the beginning, the House made it clear that using CFIUS to review outbound transfers of technology and intellectual property was for us a non-starter. This would have clearly duplicated our export control regime and overwhelmed CFIUS in a way that I believe would have harmed rather than enhanced our national security. Now, while some parties had proposed compromise language through various exemptions, the House Financial Services Committee made it clear that CFIA stood for a Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, quote unquote, as opposed to, quote, the Committee on Economic Activity Anywhere in the World, quote unquote. I believe we were right to see this issue in black and white terms, and we believe FIRMA now reflects that. Instead, we included in our provision strengthen export controls uh, spearheaded by my colleague, Chairman Ed Royce, who does double duty as Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and as a senior member of the House Financial Services Committee. 
And in this process, we actually remove CFIA's ability to name new critical technologies outside of export controls altogether, an option that was available to CFIUS before FIRMA was enacted. As a result, Congress actually made the designation of critical technologies, I believe, even more rigorous and more transparent than it had been prior to FIRMA. By channeling emerging technologies through export controls, the U.S. and its allies will have a much more accountable system to regulate innovations that affect our national security in a direct way. Once we covered the so-called outbound side of FIRMA, we turned to the inbound provisions on minority investments. The House made sure to delete virtually any substantive reference in FIRMA to distinct economic sectors for inbound investment reviews. And we certainly rejected labeling entire businesses as, quote, critical infrastructure companies, which I believe would have undoubtedly made CFIUS a tool of industrial policy whether, rather than one of national security policy. We also took away CFIUS' ability to review such transactions based on ownership percentages in so-called, quote, parallel strategic partnerships or other material financial relationships, quote, unquote. Just as we took away blanket discretion to mandate light filings for businesses. My fear was, and the fear shared by the committee, was that under the wrong administration, these provisions could have given the executive something tantamount to a blank check to block deals or to change reviews from a voluntary to a mandatory process, all of which the House found to be problematic, if not unacceptable. Equally unacceptable was the proposal that CFIUS jurisdiction should be triggered based on any involvement whatsoever by a foreign investor in, a, in the decision making of a U.S. company or based on the transfer of uh, technical information that administration could define at its own whim and discretion. Here, too, the House was far more restrained in its language and approach, and this approach was preserved in the final text. Despite this narrowing of the bill, I would reiterate that all stakeholders who care about both trade and necessary checks and balances should remain engaged as firma regulations are drafted and promulgated. Our committee, of course, will be scrutinizing them, too, in a couple of areas I believe deserve special note. To start, as many of you know, FIRMA requires CFIUS to limit its expanded jurisdiction to certain categories of foreign persons based on the countries or governments they're connected to. Now, the law does not make explicit reference to China or Russian, Russia or other countries of special concern. But it's clear that this provision is only coherent if rulemakers focus their attention on countries of highest risk to our national security. If our friends in Canada or the EU or elsewhere are lumped in as well, that would be contrary to the law's intent. And it wouldn't be surprising if that occurred to see Congress look at various avenues, including the appropriations process, to nullify potential CFIUS overreach. We'll also be looking at how CFIUS addresses critical infrastructure, a term that has a number of guardrails around it uh, in the bill. FIRMA requires an explicit listing of types and examples of critical infrastructure so that U.S. companies and foreign investors have the clarity that they need. Another area of importance is, quote, sensitive personal data excuse me, which the House worked to ensure could not be exploited in non-controlling investments in our national security uh, were endangered. Sensitive personal data is a highly deliberative term. It doesn't mean any personally identifiable information. Had Congress meant personally identifiable information, it would have said so, and it didn't. Instead, sensitive data has to be exploitable in a way that can threaten national security. Your name and address in a customer database does not meet that test. Nor does an old photo of you that, for example, exists like me in shoulder length hair and bell bottoms. <laughs> Should you have a photo like that, uh, that is also not sensitive data or a threat to national security. 
The fact that those reside, reside on a social media company's servers are not at issue here. This kind of data may be awkward for you if released to a foreign investor, but awkwardness does not meet the test of a national security threat. FIRMA's regulations should reflect this accordingly. These are just some of the issues we will be monitoring in the, company in the coming months, and I'm hopeful that CFIUS will go about its rulemaking with the same level of care and prudence that it showed after the last reform bill a decade ago. As you may know, my retirement from the House will prevent me from personally undertaking CFIUS oversight in the next Congress, but I take solace knowing that there will be compulsory annual testimony by senior CFIUS officials before our committee, which we made sure to mandate in FIRMA alongside of key reporting requirements. And again, I'm pleased that senior members on both sides of the aisle in the committee and in Congress, I believe, are committed to the same priorities that I've touched upon in my remarks. Allow me to close by saying that throughout this process, we were aware that any reforms that Congress agreed upon would inform efforts abroad to establish investment reviews like CFIUS. And certainly as our allies set up their own review mechanisms, they won't necessarily end up looking like ours and nor should they. But I hope our friends around the globe will take heart particular principles that emerge not only from our consideration of FIRMA, but from our country's vast experience with CFIUS over the last three decades. Our allies may be tempted to turn their investment reviews into a Swiss army knife of sorts, putting them in service of everything from national security to economic and social policy. It will also be alluring to trigger reviews by giving the government catch-all powers to shape industrial sectors, limit ownership stakes, and so forth, rather than be guided exclusively by national security concerns. This Congress considered and rejected proposals like these, and I hope our allies will view them skeptically as well. A Swiss Army knife, great as it is, and I own one, is almost always inferior to the specialized tool that you need to do the job, and the same goes for investment reviews. The reason businesses have confidence in CFIUS and the reason Congress entrusted it with additional authorities is because CFIUS has focused on narrow national security objectives. It has never been all things to all people. So if foreign governments hopes to emulate CFIUS, they should understand that its strength lies as much in its limits and its self-restraint as it does in CFIUS powers. So I hope that other countries, as they go about their rulemaking and lawmaking, will keep these principles in mind, just as our own Congress did in this process, so that ultimately there can be a free flow of investment across borders that can continue to strengthen innovation, strengthen economic growth, and most importantly, strengthen national security. Again, thank you for having me here today. Is this on? Okay, great. Well, that was terrific, very clear, and um, full of um, things to talk about, but I, I want to respect the audience's ability to ask a couple of questions, so prepare for maybe two or three questions. That's maybe all we have time for, but let me ask you one, maybe two, if I have time. Um, you mentioned China. You've been quite critical in other contexts of, of China or, or concern, you've expressed concern, for example, about their, um, their uh, place in the WTO or their violation of WTO rules and, and intellectual property and so forth. Um, China was not mentioned in, in, this, um, in this legislation. Um, do, do, can you explain a little more why, why not mention uh, the, the, the countries of concern? And looking on the flip side, we have some of the allied countries represented here in this audience because we have a separate conversation with them. You know, would it not give more assurance to them to either name you know, the bad guys or say, you know, here are the countries that are not of concern? Um, is, is that, why, why was that approach taken? The that well, the taking. short answer to your question is yes, I believe it would have been a superior approach. Um, and um, 
That fell out in negotiations. Uh, if Congress was made up of one individual as opposed to 535, that's how the law would have been written. Uh, but it is not. So uh, I, I originally our approach in the House was to build off of existing statutory definitions that would have created a de facto blacklist. Now the blacklist would have changed uh, depending upon the um, the actions of certain countries. So that was the original approach. I think it frankly was a superior approach. So we didn't end up with a black list. Uh, I think we ended up with a gray list. Um, I'm hopeful it's more charcoal gray uh, than light gray. But as I said earlier in my remarks, the devil remains in the details. I think it would again be uh, contrary uh, to legislative intent, and it would also strain, absolutely strain the resources of CFIUS if it wasn't restricted to a very narrow universe. And so I, I gotta tell you, in dealing with most of my colleagues, and I recently returned a few weeks ago from a trip to uh, China, um, if they are the serial violator of WTO. They obviously have a, a regime that um, in some respects, I'm not sure was contemplated by the WTO um, infrastructure and rules, and I left there fairly convinced they're probably not going to change the way they <coughs> approach um, um, our technology and our intellectual property. Um, so um, that, that, that is of concern. So anyway, I, I think a superior process would have been to have uh, a list and, and give people an opportunity to get off that list. I hope in some fact, even though we didn't kind of end up with it in a strict de jure fashion, that I trust through the rulemaking, maybe in a de facto fashion, we will end up that way. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good answer. Um, the um, other question quickly is, you mentioned Congress, um, but and what, the other thing that's striking about this legislation is that it passed at all. I mean, given how uh, difficult it is to get anything through Congress these Boy, days, you can say that again. Uh, I mean, this really stands out. What, what, are there lessons here? I mean, if you're working with Maxine Waters on a bill, uh, it seems like maybe there's hope as a citizen that we can get, we can get people together to do other things, or, or is this uh, well, is Groucho alone? Marx said, I'd never want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member, but I've got a question, do I want to be on a bill that Maxine is on? And she may ask herself the same question, but, um, you know, I hope it goes back to the old edge that partisanship ends at the, um, uh, at the ocean's edge. And I would say, again, there's just very, very strong sentiment uh, in both parties that, um, uh, again, the rules in, the, in the, the spirit and the letter of the WTO is not being lived up to. Um, that China has been a particularly, uh, has been particularly onerous in the expropriation by hook and crook of our technology and intellectual property. Just very strong feelings on both sides of the aisle. So I think in some respects, um, it was the, um, the um, kind of ingredients were there for a firma bill. Uh, I think though the real question was how broad of powers would be given to the executive branch. And I must admit, I was concerned because perhaps subject for a different time and a different audience. But I've been concerned that for decades that the legislative branch has yielded way too much power to the executive branch and that the Article Three of the Constitution judicial branch has just assumed greater powers. And too often, uh, I want to be very careful about this, and I am a firm believer in foreign direct investment. I'm a firm believer in trade. And so, um, again, the main issue was not whether or not we were going to have a firmer bill. It was how narrowly circumscribed, circumscribed would it be. Okay, excellent. Um, two questions, um, and they're bright lights here, so it's hard to see. There's a gentleman. If they're back hard there. questions, I may have Just, time. For and I'm going to take them together, so we can he can choose that which one to answer. Sure. Yes, sir. Alan Estevez from Deloitte Consulting. I was the DoD representative for the committee for six years, so I'm familiar with. Serious. Right. For, so I'm very familiar, and I want to commend you, Congressman for a well-balanced bill that came out, and I got to testify before Congressman Barr about this bill. Oh, okay, well, thank you. 
Um, my question is, given the expanded scope, narrowly scoped, but still expanded, are you concerned about the resources necessary for both Treasury and the other committee members in order to implement this? Okay, let's take a second question while you think, yes, sir. Yes. There in the third row. Well, hold on a sec, and identify yourself, please. Hi. Hi, Congressman. First of all, let me applaud you because I think your thrust on this is one I very much share. Uh, I'm Jeff Bialis, used to be at the Defense Department a while back also. My question relates to NATO and Western Europe because it's hard to see a national security rationale for applying this legislation to them in the first place. But that being the case, can you comment on why the specific exemption was eliminated that seemed very focused on allowing Treasury to exempt our uh, NATO allies and other treaty partners if they, you know, leveled up their practices in this. Because my concern is that given the history of CFIUS, which is not to make exemptions to legislation, but to retain broad authority and the consensual nature, it's going to be hard to get those kinds of exemptions that you're looking for. Okay. Uh, well, I prefer to ask multi-part questions as opposed to answer them, but if I can remember, yes, I remain concerned about resource allocation to CFIUS. Um, uh, I remain very concerned about that. Having said that, um, we have invited Treasury to submit this as part of their budget request um, that the administration will send up, uh, and as you well know, we have a new spending bill that's may see as early as Friday. Um, and that will, in some respects, carry, well, anyway, it's known as kind of a mini bus. We'll have a couple of appropriations bills in there and most likely a continuing resolution to take the rest of the government uh, to December. But uh, we've invited the Treasury to submit this, again, as part of their submission. And I think it will get a very kind view uh, in the House. I don't write bills, well, as long as I'm chairman, I'm chairman for about another 100 days, there won't be a bill coming through my committee that contains the phrase, such sums as necessary. Uh, that's not how I legislate. I need a budget. I want to know what's going on. Uh, I've got the national debt clock ticking away in my um, hearing room, and unfortunately, it's only going in one direction, and it seems to be accelerating. So uh, that's the answer there. With respect to NATO, um, again, um, my personal view was we should have had a blacklist. Others involved in the negotiations um, wanted a white list. Uh, we kind of ended up with, again, a charcoal gray list. Um, such is the nature of negotiations, such is the nature of compromise. Um, don't try to apply logic to it. It is a give and take process. Uh, I do things all the time that are illogical, but my wife asked me to do them. <laughs> and within the confines of having a happy marriage, uh, it, it makes that sense. So uh, again, I, I don't know why we would ever contemplate applying any of the expanded CFIUS authorities um, to NATO countries, uh, but having said that, as we all know, there are some changes that are taking place in NATO countries as we speak. Uh, and so again, we have other statutes in place um, in, in some respects, there are several blacklists that exist um, in law today, and that was going to be the original reference. So all I can say is, I'm repeating myself, probably said it for the third or fourth time, devil's in the details. If you have an interest in this, I would recommend staying engaged in the rulemaking process, and I'm hopeful that's where we can kind of firm up this whole uh, universe and list question a little bit more. Well, we hope you'll stay involved and you're always welcome to come back. Even as an ex-Congressman, we'd love to hear uh, your perspectives again. Thank you for coming today for your clear uh, insights. Very helpful to us. And please join thank me in thanking Congressman. Thank you, thank you. Thank you sir. I really appreciate it. You can uh, head out that way and you'll be a sort of a thank you. Stay, stay there. We're going to just put a few chairs up here and bring the panel up. So stay where you are. Thanks. <laughs>
as instructed. Um, so um, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, this uh, is an issue, FIRMA and um, investment, foreign investment screening is an issue that um, we have been following here at CSIS across a number of programs for quite a while now. Um, the interest is, um, is one that we have focused on in particular because it actually touches on a number of issues that are relevant to um, our economy, our national security, but also this kind of fundamental defining relationship that is coming to be seen between the US and China. Um, the issue of investment screening actually gets at those, um, those various aspects and for that reason, um, we've dedicated a lot of um, attention to this issue, and we have been able to pull together here um, a panel of, of true experts um, on, um, on all these different relevant topics. I'm not gonna say a whole lot, and I actually have, have asked them to not prepare um, uh, prepared comments, because I really want this to be a conversation among them, and then we're gonna leave some time at the end um, to take questions from you so that you can benefit from the expertise that we have here on stage. So let me just do some brief introductions and then we'll just kick off the conversation. So I'm gonna start down here on the far left from your side, um, Dr. Robert Adkinson. Rob is the founder and the president of the in in Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF, which focuses on issues at the intersection of technological innovation and public policy. Um, he's served in a number of administrations, both Republican and Democrat. Um, he served as the co-chair of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy's U.S.-China Innovation Policy Experts Group. So among the many things Rob does, that's one area that, um, that makes him um, quite an asset to our panel here. Next to Rob, we have Giovanna Cinelli, who's probably known to many of you as well. She leads the international trade and national security practice at Morgan Lewis. Um, she counsels clients in defense and high-tech sectors on a broad range of issues, including investment screening and export controls. Um, concurrent with her private practice, she also serves as a Naval Reserve, served as a Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer, where she specialized in Soviet-era submarine platforms, national security intelligence issues. Not as relevant for the panel, but I couldn't <laughs> resist right. adding in that little, uh, <laughs> that little tidbit. Um, next to Giovanna, we have Jason Godofsky, who is a partner at the firm of McCarthy Tretolt and head of the Antitrust Competition and Foreign Investment Group, a Canadian law firm, by the way. Um, extensive experience in advising both foreign purchasers, including regularly advising on investments invo involving state-owned enterprises. Um, he's negotiated on a wide range of industries to secure net benefit to Canada determination. So for folks that have been following um, the FIRMA issue and this idea of a net benefit or net economic benefit test with regard to foreign investment, that's something that Jason has been working on. Um, Next to Jason, we have Clay Lowry, Managing Director at Rock Creek Global Advisors, um, an international economic policy advisory firm. He's also a senior advisor here at CSIS. Um, for those following this issue, you probably know Clay and others from their testimony on the Hill. Um, from 2005 to 2009, he served as the Assistant Secretary for International Affairs at the US Treasury Department, um, where he headed up the committee um, where he chaired, sorry, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. So Clay was the Assistant Secretary at the time of the last CFIUS reform. So he has probably scars, but certainly firsthand experience of what it is to implement uh, a reform to CFIUS. And then finally, last but not least, we have Hidaka uh, Nishimura, who is with us today, joining us from Tokyo as Director of Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Investment. Um, he's currently in charge of bio industry, including pharmaceuticals, regenerative medicine, and other biotech industries. Um, he's been working with the government of Japan since the 1990s and has experience in security export control policy, industrial technology policy, and energy policy. So, um, I did not lie. Ah. Apologies, and I'm Stephanie Siegel. I'm here at CSIS, uh, Deputy Director with the Simon Share. Um, pales in comparison to this to this esteemed panel. So um, that's it in the way of, of introductions. But I really want to leave time to hear from all of you um, and hear from all of you talking amongst yourselves. 
But let me just kind of kick off from the beginning here and what we can expect in the way of implementation. So the bill was passed, signed into law back in August, um, but we know that it's actually a long uh, journey from here to there as far as implementing um, this revised CFIA. So maybe I'm going to start off with Giovanna and just ask you what can we expect in the way of, of implementation and what are the biggest open issues when it comes to the implementing regulations? That's a, an outstanding question. And I think Congressman Henserling did an excellent job in the recitation of Congress's approach. Um, I think before I actually answer that, I, I would offer one observation. If you look at CFIUS overall from when it started as an executive agency, <clears throat> executive order agency in 1975 through where it is today, the legislation that just passed is extraordinary in one particular way. It has concretely almost micromanaged an enormous part of the process, which even when you compare it to what happened in FINSA in 2006 and 2007, seems to shift the paradigm on exactly what the relationship is between the legislative and the executive branch. And I think that that's going to have a direct impact on the regulations and how they're structured. Now, the act has designated up to 18 months for regulations to be issued. Interestingly, so many portions of FIRMA actually dictate what the regulations need to say. So for example, the timelines have shifted from 30 to 45 days. There's really no discretion there. So the Treasury Department could literally issue a regulation today that says the time period is now 45 days for the initial uh, designation. And the same thing with some other areas. So one of the interesting questions um, I look at from a practitioner's perspective, is it possible the Treasury may earlier issue regulations that address directly what was included in the statute as a requirement? meaning no discretion for regulatory changes, and could we perhaps see an interim final rule or a final rule that would help expedite some of the clarity that will be needed when you actually put boots on the ground to implement the regulation? So to the second half of your question, after you remove the 18-month period, which is currently the outside amount and the possibility that they could maybe issue some regulations sooner, where are their gaps? And I think Rather than calling them gaps, I think maybe where are there opportunities for clarity and refinement that will make it practical for those on the other side of government who actually have to implement whatever it is that's going to be required. And so I think there's probably four areas that I would just generally touch upon. I'd love to hear from my colleagues. Uh, one are some of the ways definitions were handled. If you take a look at Section 17, three, it's interesting that there are definitions that are actually provided in the legislation and then there's a little tail end comment that says, and as the committee may otherwise designate. So while there are some established ground rules, let's say, that may be set a, a framework, there are areas where there could be some changes, some modifications and some enhancements. And then there are actually, actually others where it's very clear, if you look at the real estate um, area, for example, when they talk about what aspects of real estate are considered covered transactions, that section of FIRMA expressly says that the committee does not have the flexibility to expand beyond the real estate transactions that are covered in the regulations, which raises an interesting question about what you do in a geopolitically charged and ever-changing environment. What is occurring today may not be occurring tomorrow. How quickly can the regulations adapt to that is an open question because the very same parties that are reviewing the regulation or requirements, excuse me, the CFIUS filings, are also drafting the regulations. And that process is, is by itself an extraordinarily challenging process. So I think taking a look at the definitions, I think the only other thing that I would comment on is the collaboration. Um, it isn't in the past that there hasn't been collaboration amongst allies and friends and, and other countries. And frankly, China, for example, has um, a form of national security review of investments and transactions, both inbound and outbound. So it fits within the construct of what most major countries are doing. But the legislation expressly included in the sense of Congress and in the finding sections almost requirements that there be more multilateral communication and engagement. And I think that that has generated over the past several months 
the UK, UK issuing a green paper on a new review of foreign direct investment, the European Union issuing its own report on where it wants to go, enhancement, as I'm sure my panel member from Japan will discuss um, in Japan, what Australia is doing, how Canada is handling it. And as we see how transactions have been proceeding, <coughs> publicly there have been more engagements where transactions that may have gone through five or 10 years ago are now receiving additional scrutiny or getting a second look and maybe being handled differently. So I think this multilateral approach is going to affect how, when CFIA submissions are made, exactly where and under what circumstances may you be dealing with more than just the United States. So just a couple of observations. Does anybody else want to comment specifically on this issue of what are the kind of biggest gaps? I think you described them as opportunities for refinement in the CFIUS legislation, firmer legislation. Um, uh, I'll weigh in. Um, so uh, I thought the congressman put it really well, which was that um, there are a few things that have to be dealt with. It's actually a very difficult process. I happen to have run this process back in 2007, 2008. And the Treasury Department officials that have testified on FIRMA have said that was a nothing burger. You should see what we're about to do. So um, now, by the way, I lived through that time, and I didn't find it to be a nothing burger, but that's a different point. Um, it is a very difficult thing. The, m the hardest part of what is the Treasury Department and the rest of the agencies are going to be taking on is dealing with each other. They have to figure out how to argue out these issues and uh, the Treasury Department sees this differently than the Defense Department does. The Defense Department sees it differently than the Justice Department or the Homeland Security Department. And they all see it differently than the White House. And all of them have a say in this. So it is going to be a very difficult thing for them to do within an 18-month time frame. I, I, have, uh, I think that they can do it. I just think that it's going to be a very difficult thing. And there's, uh, Javon has kind of started touching upon, there's a lot of definitions that are going to have to be worked through so that we can figure out what does it mean from what the congressman said about sensitive personal data. He's correct. It's supposed to be tied to national security. It's not when I go in and buy a hammer at Home Depot and they get a little bit of data from me. It's supposed to be something more than that so that when a foreign investment comes in to buy a Home Depot, is that a national security or not? And that is something that they're going, that, they're, that is going to be, there's going to be lots of issues like that. Um, there's going to be debate about timelines as well. And actually one of the really positive things I saw of the legislation was how the timelines could work out. So right now, the way CFIUS has this gap in how it does timelines, it's actually got two gaps. One is that if you file a case right now, CFIUS doesn't have to take it for a while. And then, because everyone talks about once you file it, the process starts, you've kind of put your coin in the meter, and you know that it's going to be over in 30 days, 45 days, 75 days, what have you. Actually, that's not true. I and mean, if you had 10 years ago, uh, CFIUS would basically take a filing and within 72 hours would tell you whether that filing was good or not. Three years ago, maybe it would last, maybe it would be a week, maybe, maybe a couple weeks. Now it's over a month. And so that actually has made it so, remember, time is money and in the investment world, and so it's expanded out. The legislation actually shrinks that down to 10 days. That's actually a very positive thing. It creates a little more certainty in the timelines. Um, it puts pressure on CFIUS, the, the agencies, but, but frankly, they've been using it because they've become too busy, which goes to the point, I think, uh, somebody asked about whether or not they have enough resources to the congressman. And the answer from everybody that testified, every single person, government or non-government, is they do not. And so that will be an issue that they're going to have to work through. I think one thing that Giovanna did not mention, and I think it's an important point, is pilot programs. So in the legislation, um, so there's actually, right now, there's kind of three terms. There's short term, what actually has changed right now because there's legislation and a few things actually did change. There's the long term, which is the rulemaking process, which is going to take, which is kind of what we've really been talking about. And then there's the kind of what I would call the medium to indeterminate term, which is the, uh, is pilots. Are there going to be any pilots and what does a pilot actually do? And the, it was interesting, there was a letter that was put forward by, uh, Chairman Henserling, 
uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Waters, Barr, and uh, Gwen Moore to Treasury to say, hey, by the way, when you're doing these pilot projects, make sure you realize, like, you kind of talk to us about doing certain things. So I actually thought the easiest thing they could do is do a pilot project in commercial real estate, which is part of the expansion. And this letter makes it suggest, almost suggest, like, they shouldn't do that. And so maybe that's a good thing, but I have no idea. But um, I can say this, is that we'll have to see what happens over the next 18 months as to does Treasury and the rest of the government come up with pilot projects to start implementing little aspects of this legislation or doesn't it? Congress obviously put that provision in there so that, uh, that the administration could do things, but they did put limitations around it. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Stephanie, the very <clears throat> impression point that you made about the timelines and the 10-day period, you know, having seen hundreds of CFIUS filings from the outside, and having had to deal with co-counsel for either the purchaser or the, the seller, uh, it is always an interesting process to decide what to put into a CFIUS notice. While there are required questions right now, there is a lot of leeway in how you describe a transaction, how you describe your cybersecurity plan, what level of detail you provide. I will be very interested in seeing whether the regulations are going to uh, promote or otherwise require a certain degree of specificity or at least certain baseline requirements because sometimes the extended periods that Clay was talking about come from the fact that you can read a notice and just very candidly you can't even understand what it says, let alone describe what it is you're supposed to do. So if I'm on the receiving end, there are times that I, when we prepare these notices, I put myself in the position of a government uh, individual who has to look at it and I say, if I need to read this and make a determination on whether it provides either what the regulations require or what is needed from a national security analysis, can I do that and may I do that cogently and rationally? If the answer to that question is not a resounding yes, then the problem is in the submission, not in the government agencies that are conducting the review. So it, I'm hoping that, and that's why I say some enhancement, that the regulations will provide some clarity to short circuit that so that the 10 day period that Clay referenced w was adequate for that analysis. <coughs> so, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I was, I was just going to say a couple of things. First, I'm certainly not going to talk about gaps in U.S. legislation since uh -huh. I have enough trouble with gaps in Canadian legislation. But <laughs> what, I, what I will say is just that it's important to remember that uh, this U.S. law, like all laws, but this U.S. law in particular has, has great extraterritorial effects. And indeed, you know, I'm, I'm working on a transaction right now that is uh, an acquisition of a Canadian business. And we're finding it very difficult uh, to deal with the fact that these regulations have to come out, and there's a tar there's a subsidiary in the in the United States, and this is an area that's sensitive, and it's coming from one of the countries we've mentioned, uh, or the, uh, the, the the chairman mentioned, and so I do think it's very important that these issues get clarified very quickly because the United States trading partners are feeling the effect of uh, of of uncertainty. Uh, as well. So that's the, the first thing. The second thing I just say on timelines, in my experience, more from a Canadian perspective, that anytime you have legislation that's inherently either socioeconomic, uh, su subjective, has very limited or no opportunity for judicial review, there's a final decision maker, it's not based on economic grounds or some other, th or, or some other elements that are strictly easily to be interpreted by a judge. Timelines matter a little less because ultimately, if you're facing down a, a block, you're going to pull and refile. You're going to do whatever you can to push out the period to allow fact gathering to happen. And so, at least on the Investment Canada Act process, we've got timelines. But the minister could at any time say, "Well, could I have more time?" And if you say no, then the answer is, "Well, then your investment can't go forward." So therefore, you're going to say yes, and the timelines expand out. And so again, if you have pull and refile opportunities, et cetera, these timelines matter a little bit less. So I think it, it just is important not worrying so much about timelines, and, but really how quickly government's really prepared to get to the bottom of issues and whether, whether they're, quite frankly, being honest about the concerns or whether there's political issues that underlie uh, the, uh, the particular investment. Thanks. And I actually, I want to come back to how Firma looks, both firma and export control actually look from other current and other country perspectives. But before I do that, both Giovanna and Clay, you kind of got at the definitional 
issues. Um, one of the key questions that keeps coming up relates to covered transactions and then the relevance now of emerging and foundational technologies in both the firma context and the export controls context. And we, ha we have a technology expert here on the panel. So Rob, I want to ask you first, what is it that firma does that gets at our ability to control, I guess, these sensitive technologies? Um, and then secondly, is it possible to ex ante identify emerging and foundational technologies when they're precisely that, they're emerging, so we don't really know ultimately what the application is going to be? Sure. So it's uh, a little unclear what emerging and foundational technologies are. They're, they're, they're broader than controlled technology. We know what a controlled technology is. It would be, uh, it might be, uh, uh, high performance computing equipment that we couldn't export to China, let's say. But what is emerging and foundational technology? And so there's two issues there. One would be, uh, you know, it'd be technologies that are adjacent to a lot of military technology. So what is the military doing now? They're spending, there just was an announcement yesterday at the White House, and DARPA just announced another thing recently. They're spending a lot of money on AI, so artificial intelligence. Is it going to be a defense technology? Um, robotics and autonomous systems are defense technologies. Uh, certainly, uh, it, you, you could even argue perhaps batteries and, and advanced electronics in 5G. The soldier, the battlefield soldier of the future is going to be a connected soldier. Um, I think the real question is, is more about um, two things I think are different now than they were back in 1980 or even in the early 90s. Number one is the boundary between defense and non-defense technologies is much more amorphous than it ever has been. 40 or 50 years ago, it was clear the defense technology system, you could define it pretty clearly. You were in defense or you weren't. Uh, and then people talked about defense spin-off, so you'd be working on some defense technology. It would spin off to the commercial sector. Now it's much more amorphous. Uh, th uh, that's why uh, Ash Carter, Secretary Carter, opened up DUIX in Silicon Valley, because they're dependent upon commercial innovation. They're just too small a player to drive defense innovation on their own anymore. So uh, we c we're in a world where it doesn't, you, cannot, you cannot segregate out defense technology anymore. Uh, and then the second part of that is um, how would the government know what is an emerging and foundational technology? That requires some level of technical capability and some level of deep industrial knowledge. And let me just put it out there. I don't think our government has that capability anymore. I think 50 years our government had that capability. But we've hollowed out those capabilities, particularly in commerce, but, uh, even in defense. Um, you really, you know, the, 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 the ability of those folks, first of all, the number of them and the depth of them to be able to really deeply understand what's going on today in robotics or what's going on in AI. I mean, the fact that we got a call a while ago from, I won't say what agency, but an agency I thought knew better, asking us what was going on with a particular technology in China. You shouldn't be calling us, you know, you should know that question. And I think that's, that's going to be an important question because there are going to be a lot of borderline cases where somebody's going to have to make a call and ideally you would want that call to be made on the basis of fairly good technical knowledge and industrial knowledge. And, and so is the answer to that then, so part of the bill was actually to provide additional resources then to the CFIUS process and supporting agencies. So is part of the answer staffing up and getting that sort of capacity in government or is there something else? Is there some other way of getting at these technologies or is it just not possible? Well, I don't think the knowledge is going to be in Treasury uh, or can be in Treasury. That's not what Treasury's expertise is about. It's about other things, financial things. We've had a, a proposal out there to create, a, 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 as, as part, of the NE, a part of the NSC, an Industrial Intelligence Council. Uh, so you could put, put it somewhere in the White House where you'd have a pretty deep knowledge of, of sort of in industrial intelligence. And what do I mean by that? What, is our, what are our production capabilities in certain advanced technologies? Who are our firms? Who are our allies? Uh, are the Japanese in there so we don't have to worry as much? Uh, 
We really don't have that, and, and, and so the question is, how do we build it? And you could build part of it in the White House. I think we have to expand uh, the DOD industrial base program, which is not as robust as it used to be. And then I would argue expanding the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Department of Commerce, the Inter International Trade uh, Administration, where they used to have very deep expertise. If you wanted to know what was going on in the uh, in the machine tool industry, there'd be two or three people in commerce who really understood machine tools. And how are we gonna do that? You're gonna have to spend money. That's the only way to do it and, and figure out a way to get good people to come back into, into, into government. If I could if just, I could, oh, go ahead, go ahead, John. Ahead, sorry, thanks. So if I could comment, because I agree with everything you've said, and I think the key is all about visibility in this area. So FIRMA established a process where they expressly said Treasury would not be identifying critical technologies of which one of the elements in 1703A6 was emerging and foundational technologies. And as an aside, it was interesting to me that they called it emerging and foundational as opposed to emerging and fundamental, which is the term currently used in the Export Administration Regulations and the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations and the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. So I'm not sure whether there's a distinction between fundamental and foundational. But allowing the Commerce Department through the Export Control Reform Act of 2018, they established a process under Section 1758 that says the Commerce Department will establish a process to identify emerging and foundational technologies. And I think you're exactly right. There's two sides to that coin. First of all, is there the technical expertise? But secondly, how are you gonna find out about it? And unless there's a process to bring something to someone's attention before you discover that you need an application, the process will always be behind. It'll just be impossible to catch up. It'll be a reactive process. And to a certain extent, that was some of the challenges that people saw with, let's say, the export control regime, because they said it's just reacting when people come in, ask for a license, then you decide whether it can go. CFIUS was supposed to be proactive. So I think there's some challenges here. Uh, but between the Emerging Technologies Committee that they're trying to establish at Commerce, there's an Office of Science Technology Policy that has some expertise. The Commerce Department collects tons of data through the BEA forms, the Bureau of Economic Analysis form about investments in intellectual property. There's all these things out there, it just requires someone to pull it together. So sorry, Clay. No, actually, um, you just largely made the point I was going to make, which is we have to <laughs> distinguish between FIRMA, which is about CFIUS, or the CFIUS portion, and then the kind of the enhanced export control portion, which is about this new technology that we're talking about. And, and Giovanna made up very, some very good points. I actually think it's a very important point. The congressman made the great point about follow the regulations, follow the rulemaking that Treasury basically will be in charge of on CFIUS uh, to see that you follow a, a sound process and we don't end up with something uh, kind of silly um, or over, over the top on CFIUS. The same actually will go on the export control side. And um, uh, I mean, commerce has already started the process of bringing an expertise and a uh, technical committee, so to speak. Um, but you know, there's probably a debate going on. You saw this debate played out on the CFIUS de debate, which is, all right, artificial intelligence. Should artificial intelligence be an export controlled item? Artificial intelligence is a very broad concept. There's all sorts of different products and, and uh, technologies that come out of it. So the answer is probably no. Now, are there some specific areas that may, and specific ways of defining technology that should be looked at and potentially controlled and that we try to multilateralize that process through an export control regime? And the answer on that is probably yes. And so there is probably debate about how broad this should be. Do you have a, like an extremely aggressive export control regime that you just say it's artificial intelligence? Or do you have a regime that actually tries to use technical capabilities so that the United States actually stays competitive around the world on these issues? I think that is going to play out over the next, uh, well, probably 20 years, but let's, it's playing out over the next six to nine months just as a starting point, and that is something that is definitely worth watching. I'm going to make a short comment on identifying emerging technology. I think uh, uh, identifying emerging technology is a super challenging task 
So accordingly, uh, we match together uh, uh, the expertise uh, of all available uh, sources, including uh, governments and uh, research institutes and uh, industries and academia, in order to identify uh, those technologies. Japan, on its part, uh, would like to exchange uh, opinions uh, with uh, relevant uh, organizations, uh, such as uh, the uh, US DOC, uh, Department of Commerce, and so on. Yes, short sure. Well, and, and this is a question I actually mm. wanted to raise with you specifically, but I'm curious to hear from all the panelists on this. With regard to whether we're talking about technology or really any number of policies, whether we're, we're talking about trade, foreign investment screening, technology transfer. Um, how should we be thinking about this if it's a unilateral action versus a multilateral action? If something can only be done unilaterally, US-led, but uh, either it takes a long time to get others on board, or maybe it's just not possible to get others on board, what does that mean for the effectiveness of, of any regime? Um, and maybe I'll, okay. I'll start with you, but I'd be curious to hear from, from okay, everyone. Okay. I think uh, each, each country has uh, its own uh, unique security environment. So uh, I think uh, there are uh, situations uh, where a unilateral action may also be important. Uh, having said that, as you uh, pointed out, uh, it is also true that in some cases uh, there is a limitation to what the uh, unilateral response can do. Uh, rather, my understanding is that uh, when it comes to security, international cooperation, especially among countries with sensitive technologies, is a highly important uh, issue. The uh, global security environment is becoming increasingly challenging. Uh, reflective of this, uh, major countries, including not only the US, uh, but also, for example, Japan and Germany, the UK and Australia, uh, have strengthened uh, their investment screening system over the past year. Other countries, including the EU and France, uh, are also currently considering uh, in introducing a new regulatory measures and or uh, strengthening uh, existing ones. Uh, these very uh, movements illustrate the ongoing uh, inclination uh, toward a multilateral approaches to security threat uh, posed by investment. It is indeed a welcoming development. Uh, what is important right now under such circumstances is a cooperation among uh, these countries. Uh, specifically, it is important to share information uh, such as best practices and uh, security concerns uh, in order to realize more precise, more precise investment control. In this sense, I would like to applaud the uh, uh, inclusion of the information sharing uh, provisions in the Pharma Bill. Uh, on our part, uh, Japan hopes to enhance, uh, enhance, uh, enhance uh, information sharing with the US and other key countries uh, to deepen international collaboration and coordination in pursuit of a precise and efficient investment control. Probably. Yeah, I would just second that by, by saying uh, a couple of things. One. Uh, I agree with the chairman that we should have had a blacklist, and, and the you know, blacklist has one country on it. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe a few, but certainly has China on it, because they have essentially a blacklist. You can't invest in China without a JV. Uh, why we allow that? But secondly, the other thing is, the Chinese now, for example, under their uh, integrated circuit national industrial strategy, has allocated anywhere between 100 to $160 billion to just write checks to Chinese semiconductor firms. Why are they doing that? Because they're way behind European, Japanese, Korean, and American semiconductor firms. Semiconductor technology is a critical defense technology. You know, I'm not, I know there are certain chips that are like hardened and super good and can go in fighter planes, but semiconductor capability gives you defense capability. 
if you're a Chinese firm and you're trying to go in with a big massive subsidy to buy a, a Japanese semiconductor firm or a Korean or a Taiwanese, you don't even go there because they will not let you do that. Just straight up, straight up. You can't do that. Uh, it's not defense related, it's just you cannot take our core technology. And the reason is because it's not like when a German firm comes to the U.S. or Toyota comes here. I mean, Toyota is investing you know, like a billion dollars in AI research in Silicon Valley. I mean, they're coming here because they want to add to the ecosystem. The Chinese firms come here or they try to go to other countries extracting technology. And that's the big, big difference. And so we're beginning to see that in Europe now. Uh, I think Europe is going to go further. Um, and so I couldn't agree more that we have to have robust information sharing because there's a lot of these deals that, are, that you can't see the Chinese. Maybe we, we find it and we can share it with our allies or they find it. But that's to me a pretty important next step that we've got to institutionalize that. I think that's a very insightful comment and in, uh, both about the blacklist and other things. One of the key areas in investment is creativity. In the days of somebody coming in and just saying, I'm going to buy you, or let's have a merger, or let's have uh, you know, a 50% ownership, those are waning because the multi-layered nature uh, and the stratified nature of investments is about as creative as either the tax lawyers or any other corporate structuring lawyers can be. It's all about how do you put the investment together to meet the objectives. And it is now not necessarily clear who the parties are in an investment at times, because the, the parties can change over the course of time. So a combination of looking at firma very practically and looking at what's happening, multi happening multilaterally means that there will have to be more information sharing because something about the parties may be known, for example, to the Japanese government or the Canadian government, but will be opaque to us here because that's not how it's structured. And so I think that's absolutely essential. I also thought your point about, for example, using artificial intelligence, as Clay mentioned too, you know, sometimes the perspective that's important in deciding whether something is critical is by saying, is it important to the other person, rather than is it just important to the United States? Because the question becomes, if the technology is used by someone who is not US, how will it be used and how will that impact us? Not solely do we have the latest and greatest technology, because to use, for example, thermal imaging and night vision, uh, you can have some very effective close quarter combat fighting using Gen 2 night vision equipment. You do not need next gen or, or other levels in order to meet that. Is it better if you have the, the more advanced? Of course, there's other overwhelming circumstances that could make it better, but it doesn't mean it's not effective. So when you look at that, I think there's two perspectives. And I'm hoping that the export control process in the identification of emerging and foundational technologies, as well as the updates to the commerce control list and the US munitions list, will take this into account. So what they're doing is actually managing and obtaining insight into the areas that really do um, <coughs> matter to us. Uh, I, I would just take a different view. Um, Good. Which is, you know, <laughs> not, a like very, a not a very Canadian approach. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I am actually very opposed to the ideas of blacklists, and although I don't understand totally the scope of the blacklist you're talking about, but I'll, just to give you an example, the first national security case in Canada was even before we amended our legislation, and the, and the, the um, investor was from this country called the United States, which, by the way, it found out that we may be at odds as we're finding out with our aluminum and uh, steel tariffs and maybe in autos that we maybe are, are not as good friends as I thought. But the, but the fact of the matter is that, that was a transaction where a U.S. company was going to buy the geospatial arm uh, of a Canadian company. And uh, it was blocked on national security grounds because we wanted to continue to have access to the imagery that was uh, that was going to become that was uh, that the that the Canadian business had access to, and the U.S. government said absolutely you could have access to it so long as there's no U.S. national security interest in the information. Otherwise, you can't have access to it anymore. And obviously, that affected Canadian uh, Canada's national security interest. So I don't think blacklists are, are good. I think actually having legislation that's fact-based on every transaction action is looked at it on its own and there's no assumptions of problems uh, and that you look at you, you actually you look at the uh, investment 
um, you know, from the specifics. And I don't think every Chinese investment is a problem. I do a lot of work with Chinese investors. Uh, and you know, and you've got to make a distinction. Are you talking about state-owned enterprises? Are you talking about private investors? Or what, uh, what, 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 el what amount of investment is the problem? And under what circumstances? And can you do it, deal with the concerns through mitigation? Can you deal with the concerns through relying on export controls? You know, you mentioned as an example that um, you know they just come you know, may come in and, and take technology. There's a lot of investment that's being done at Canadian universities by Chinese uh, by by Chinese companies right now, funding our universities. And and I think each country should decide what their policy makes sense uh, for for them. But uh, from my perspective. Having a blacklist is, is not the not the way to go. Well, if I can just clarify, my, my idea of a blacklist is is, is, is twofold. And what one it would be, it would, they certainly should have some flexibility to accept certain things. So if the Chinese, first of all, I think we have to differentiate also between greenfield and and acquisitions. And so, you know, if the Chinese want to come in here and build a solar panel factory, uh, sure, I guess that's fine. Uh, it's different than, than, than buying up our solar panel companies, which they have done, stripped out the technology, moved it back to China, bankrupted the U.S. industry, then come in here with state-backed funds to buy up the IP assets on 10 cents on the dollar. I mean, so the reason I think why we have to be tougher here is twofold. One is a fairly large share of Chinese, at least in the technology space where I'm familiar, is government-backed with a price premium. So you look at a company like Lexmark, which is the global printer company. Um, Lexmark and HP both had a lawsuit in Chinese courts against this Chinese printer company. I don't remember the name of it, I've written about it. Uh, because they were stealing their printer head, patented technology, the inkjet technology. They're stealing it, no question about it. Um, the government goes to this firm and says, we want you to, and I use the word, I quote the term, exact term they use, we want you to dominate the global printer industry and we're gonna give you $3.6 billion to go out and buy at a 40% price premium what you could buy Lexmark for with any investor. I would have blocked that deal. Now, does that have any national security implications? No, although I could argue indirectly that it might, it's, it's high tech, it sort of helps them, but I would have blocked it just because it's completely unfair. We shouldn't allow massive subsidized government acquisitions of American firms. Yeah, so you're, you're both touching on, I'd mentioned kind of in the intro here, that one of the reasons we, CSIS, has been following this issue as closely as we have, not that we don't love foreign investment screening, but it's because it actually goes to this bigger question of how the U.S. and China um, handle their economic relations and, and their kind of comprehensive bilateral relations. And this discussion actually does give a good sense for just how far the... Um, the pendulum has swung in a way to um, where I think there was a less skeptical view of Chinese investment, just treating it as any other type of foreign investment, to now really looking kind of first and foremost at the national security implications um, as the kind of lead consideration. But there's also those that probably are not saying it that loudly because it's not particularly a popular view to have in Washington right now, but I think some are questioning, has the pendulum actually swung too far, and are we now at risk of actually damaging the open investment climate? But I, I, that's a question that I'd like to put to the panel and kind of impact on overall investment climate and also the innovative ecosystem, because a lot of this money has actually been coming in and funding early stage startup investments. Clay, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, so. So Rob makes a point which is not actually part of the legislation whatsoever, which is basically a kind of an economics benefits test. Um, and that's not the legislation. The legislation is about national security. So I, I disagree a little bit with Stephanie's premise, which was that we kind of, that when we looked at foreign investment coming in from China, that it was kind of, hey, it's just the same as anybody else's. That's actually not the case. Now, the Obama administration was very clear. We welcome Chinese investment. I think the Bush administration, I don't remember if the Bush administration actually said that. The Bush administration, I know, said we welcome foreign direct investment. Um, and there wasn't as much Chinese investment, direct investment, back in the Bush administration. There was no Obama administration. But any time a transaction came in that had any national security nexus whatsoever and China was involved, I promise you, it was not being treated the same as a Canadian investment. It just wasn't. Um, now. The CFIUS people can't say that out loud because it's based on a bunch of intelligence information. And they're certainly not trying, they were not in the midst at that point trying to create 
a black hat list, a white hat list, or any other list. But that behind the scenes, on, in the actual meetings, it is the case. I mean, I used to always say, if it is a Chinese company that is buying something that is national security, assume on the scale of zero to 10, where 10 is like it's a national security problem, it is either a nine or a 10. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the transaction can't go through because that gets you into what is the vulnerabilities of the, of the asset that is being purchased. Um, and is there going to be some consequence to that? Rob's bringing up a very broader point, which is whether or not should we be, should, and this is where you get into what the Trump administration has done through its uh, 301 investigation on China, about whether or not they're still in intellectual property. And we've seen that, um, we've seen tar a variety of different tariffs have gone into place and, and some more are being threatened. And so that's a long-winded answer getting towards Stephanie's question, which is could all of this have an impact on, on investment into the United States? The answer is probably yes, but I will say that investment flows are driven by a lot of factors, a lot of factors that have absolutely nothing to do with anything we've talked about today. Um, and so I think the fact that the legislation came out with creating some degree of certainty, and obviously there's a rulemaking process and so forth, but at least people have an idea of what they have to think about when they're thinking about CFIUS, I think is po a very positive thing. I think there's some, gonna be some negative things that you know, are going to be industry specific. For instance, the commercial real estate market, um, which is basically greenfield type of investments, never really, they didn't know what CFIUS was. I mean, it just didn't mean anything. And so um, now they're gonna have to start thinking about it. Because if you're near a military site or another national security site, which by the way, you might not even know you are near one, you're gonna, you may have to go through a CFIUS process. I think it's gonna be much more difficult and uh, on the trying to figure out how do I look at non-controlling, non-passive investments into critical infrastructure, sensitive personal data, and critical uh, technology. That is going to be a lot harder thing to do. Um, and let me try to explain why I think that is, which is the way that right now CFIUS is kind of, everybody sort of knows what CFIUS is, is there's a, a bar, and it's called the mergers and acquisitions bar. Um, Giovanna is part of it. And, um, and so you basically, there's an M&A transaction, there's foreign direct investment, and some lawyer who's part of the deal who probably doesn't even barely knows what CFIUS goes, isn't this thing supposed to go through CFIUS? <laughs> and so that actually leads you towards people filing, or, or not filing, depending on what the transaction is. If you have a non-controlling investment, into critical technology company. And remember, the whole examples that everybody used during this time was the startup operation out of Silicon Valley. Two guys have created some amazing technology. They barely even know what they're sitting on. And some Chinese investor comes in and says, I'll give you a million dollars. Give me 3% equity and a board seat. And you know, just let my engineers talk to your engineers. But that's it. I don't, you, you run the business any which way you want. How are those people going to know what CFIUS is? I mean, um, and they're just not. There's, not that, there's, there's no merger or acquisition there. And so that's gonna be a hard thing that I think Treasury is going to have to start a marketing campaign. And as a former Treasury Department official for 16 years, marketing is not our strong suit at the, <laughs> at the Treasury Department. And so they will, I mean, they'll have to figure out how do you do this? How do you make, promulgate these rules to a way that people actually understand that are, that are in the business world and have never, ever even thought of Washington, D.C., let alone CFIUS? Um, and so that, now, will that harm investment? It could, but I think it'll be at a small level because there has been at least some clarity uh, provided through this bill process. So if, if I could, uh, Clay is always so eloquent. I, I just, I love being on panels with him. So I think the answer is Treasury should- going to disagree with me. No, no. <laughs> uh, I, I think that the, the point you made about visibility into the, the emerging technologies is absolutely spot on. And you know, maybe Treasury needs to have an annex office, the way the Commerce Department has these regional offices where DIUX set up a facility out in Silicon Valley and maybe actually being boots on the ground where all this development is being born. Maybe a starting point. I think 
the, the communication that happens between the two-person garage brilliant inventor and let's say the, the mega organization with a corporate R&D laboratory that is more aware of it is truly the crux of the problem because we've transitioned over the last 30 years uh, most of the transactions initially were big behemoths getting together, whether they were private-private or venture capitalists or public companies. Now, a lot of what you see is private equity buying a two-person shop or uh, a company, a public company, trolling to find the seven-man shop that's doing the really cool uh, sensors. It's, so it's a different kind of acquisition environment, kind of a David versus Goliath. And so not only the government may be putting itself boots on the ground, but those who are doing the investing, because they are integrated into the community, can maybe bring some of that message out to the community and say, hey, here's some things to keep in mind. Now, having said that, I, I don't know many people who like in that community or uh, lots of regulations, and there are impediments that regulations bring. I do think, though, in response to your question, the innovation economy in the United States and globally is incredibly resilient. And even were there an impact of some sort, I think it, like Clay said, I think it would be minimal. And I actually think it would be a springboard to even more innovation, because I think that's how the economy works. It's all about solutions. Can I ask I know Rob first, and then Jason? Yeah, so just quickly, a couple of things. Uh, Clay, so just to clarify what I believe, I don't believe in a net benefits test. I think it's a terrible idea. Um, and I think we should be extremely open to uh, particularly market-based uh, democracies <laughs> investing here. I just don't think China falls into that category. Secondly, I think, it's, I think you're making it a little harder than you think. You could probably wrap up 90% of all technology startups if you went and gave four speeches. The National Venture Capital Association, the Association of University Technology Managers, the SEED and Early Stage Venture Association, and the National Incubation Association. In other words, if you go to those intermediaries, uh, you're going to get most of the startups. I don't think it's an information problem as much as you think. One last thing I'll bring up that I don't think anybody's talked about is one of the provisions um, in the Export Control Reform Act was if you get government R&D money, you're more, I don't know if it's you're more likely to get a review or you have to get a review, but that's a pretty dramatic change. We've never done that before, and I was in some hearings where that came up, like why do we give, why do we let some U.S. company have an R&D grant through DARPA or through SBIR or, or maybe through some other place? and they then transfer the technology to another country. Well, now it's going to be harder to do that. You're going to have to show that you took government money and, and you might not be able to open up a facility in another country. And that's, that's a whole new thing that we've never done before. Okay. <coughs> Jason. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say about a net benefit test. I agree with you and we have a net benefit test and I'm sure we'll get into, into the industrial policy component of our foreign investment review. But I would say a, a number of things. First, uh, go to China a fair amount and, and they're well aware of, of, of CFIUS and, uh, and, and unless the U.S. company is actually looking for the expertise from, from, uh, from the Chinese investor as opposed to just looking for capital to help, uh, to help them, they probably don't care that much, the, 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 as much the U.S. investor because they can have their capital, it's the, it's the Chinese investor who's really, uh, who's really hanging out there and that's because there's no, uh, to my mind, there's no limitation period. Uh, whereas, at least in Canada, on our, on our statute, at least at some point, the investor gets certainty uh, of time uh, that the, the government can't come back. And, and as far as the chill goes, I do worry about these things because um, the chill will come uh, whenever uh, you think you're safe and you've now been investing time and effort in a business only to find out that CFIUS is coming back at some future point in time. Uh, and now looking at this investment, and then that will make big news. And and then I, I do worry on the broader geopolitical issues dealing with anti, because I also wear an antitrust hat. And now U.S. companies uh, are around the world, and if they want to do deals and they're efficiency enhancing deals, deals that are important to their ability to grow, they're going to have to get approvals all over the world, including Mofcom and so forth. And so you can't just look at the narrow issue and say, well, we could just ignore uh, chi you know, China or investments from China, because it's going to end up having, I think, a, a broader chilling effect on investments, and in, not just in technology, but across the industrial uh, uh, base. So I, I do think these things are so interconnected right now. 
I, 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 let me just add that I agree with that whole last paragraph he just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that actually goes to kind of my, my last formal question for you guys before opening it up to the audience, and that is what this looks like from uh, from other country perspectives, in particular U.S. allies and partners, um, is what has been uh, now the law of the land in the U.S. Is this a model that others are looking to adopt? And are we, in effect, kind of setting a global standard or at least a standard among like-minded countries? Um, and you might be the best person to, <laughs> to start that off, but also, Jason, your view. Yeah. Uh... Of course, uh, uh, I'm at the uh, 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 authority for uh, export control and uh, investment screening system in Japan. Uh, actually, um, uh, uh, I highly uh, appreciate uh, evaluate the, uh, uh, the U.S. government effort uh, to strengthen investment screening and so on. And uh, but uh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, international cooperation is very important thing uh, to uh, 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 realize uh, uh, good uh, export control investment screening. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, like minded country uh, uh, gather to share uh, information, uh, exchange information or uh, concerns or. Uh, best practices and uh, and also uh, identifying uh, emerging technology and uh, uh, how to uh, control uh, such kind of uh, emerging uh, technologies. Uh, such kind of thing uh, is very important to uh, collaborate with uh, uh, other countries. Uh, that is my opinion. Um, Jay, and I should mention too, it's kind of Japanese and Canadian perspective, but also official sector versus private sector participant perspective, which may kind of uh, skew the responses. But yeah, I mean, from a, from from our perspective, I mean, we've had foreign investment review in Canada for a long time. Uh, it was it was entirely industrial policy up until uh, 2009 when we adopted a national security uh, review and it was actually, as I mentioned, that Alliant Tech Systems transaction. Um, in that case, um, the government blocked the deal, although they didn't admit it was on national security, it was effectively on national security. And that's because at the end of the day, in my view, national security as a concept bleeds very into industrial policy. It's sometimes hard to understand where the lines uh, mix, and I even think on our panel today, you made, made the mention of Lexmark, and you said I would have, I would have, you know, blocked that. I don't know if it's national security, but you know, and because it, it was from China, it was come from China, from Canada, from, I wouldn't have. Right, but the point is, there's a, there is, there is an, I think, I do think there's an industrial, general industrial policy issue there, unless you say that it's critical, that was critical technology or, or something. And from, from my perspective, and I, and I think that's because it's hard at times to, to, to kind of figure out where national security ends and, and, and wanting to make sure that the best interests of your home country are, you know, from future, uh, from future growth is going to be protected. And so I do worry that um, unless we have clear definitions, et cetera, that, that you can take these, uh, th this legislation, um, just like it's happened in Canada, and it becomes uh, highly politicized. And it becomes hard as an advisor to be able to advise companies on when to do transactions. And you've got to remember that this, this whole process is very opaque. It's not transparent. Um, by definition, the concerns that they have, uh, that the government has, are not often shared, uh, certainly not in detail, with the investor because you know, to reveal that information is to reveal national security information, who the source is, what's the nature of the concern, et cetera. So you are very much in a situation as, a, as an investor that you're, you're hanging out to dry. And I just finished a transaction, unfortunately, that was blocked um, in Canada, um, CCCI, Acon, it was a construction company. Uh, wouldn't have been the normal uh, kind of company that you would have expected uh, to be uh, to, to raise national security concerns, and it was it was highly uh, politicized, and it also happened at the same time that we were right in the middle of NAFTA negotiations and so on and so forth. And the U.S. did have concerns with the transaction, so I do worry that um, if we're not very clear on, and have clear definitions, etc., that there's a lot of uh, opportunity for politics to get infused in there, not strictly national security. And just last week, the 
the, the chairman of uh, the CIBC, which is Canada, one of Canada's uh, largest banks, one of their five major banks, you know, put out a paper, you know, asking Ottawa to make sure they provide much more clarity because we're actually seeing a real reduction in foreign investment in Canada because of um, because of this lack of clarity on deal term on 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 definitions and so forth and how the government's going to apply it. So, I, you know, the, this legislation is important. No doubt, national security has to be. Um, has to be looked after, but the devil will be in the detail and its application. And if it's looked at too broadly, I think it has these kind of laws have huge chilling effects. Well, um, thank you, because a panel that everyone agrees with one another is incredibly boring for the audience. So I'm I'm grateful for the fact that we can have this kind of discussion. Um, we could continue this here, but I do want to leave time for questions from the audience. Um, and so. If you have a question, you just want to raise your hand, um, a microphone will make its way over to you. If you could give your name and your affiliation uh, and which panelist you're directing the question to, uh, we'll go from there. Oh, okay, sorry. I always talk bad when I stand up. Um, so my name is Brandon Hughes. Um, I run a small business intelligence firm, FAO Global. And I had a couple questions. Um, like, like uh, this is to the whole panel. This is to the whole panel. But um, if someone has a better answer, please jump in. Um, well, first off, over the last few months, I've gone to a bunch of investment conferences in the U.S. and in China, for example. And I do, I talk a lot with small and medium-sized firms. On both sides, they are very uncertain, and it, it's trending over the last few months, obviously, with the trade disputes. Um, but also questions about CFIUS, investment, what can they investment, what is national security? I think you gave a great example of, um, you know, potentially anything could be uh, if, it, if, it, if it's not a net benefit or from a certain country. And I think that's, from my side, uh, firms are starting to see that. Um, I've talked with a Chinese firms interested in investing in blockchain or um, for agriculture, for healthcare. And they are questioning me on if CFIUS is going to block their um, acquisition or even minority um, acquisition of a Chinese firm. So I guess the question is from Firma and what, how you interpret it, do, do you feel that this gives more certainty to small and medium-sized companies that aren't related to state-owned en enterprises, both on the um, foreign investment side and then also the export control side? Thank you. Well, let me just say, I thought Congressman Hensarling uh, made the point beautifully. Uh, it will be all about the regulations. The law does set out a lot of framework, and there is also some certainty in the law, whether you're talking about a, a day period, the fees that may eventually be needed, certain definitions of critical technologies, and, and certain exemptions on how they structured covered transactions. But the regulations will be the place where the most certainty will arise. I think it becomes a very delicate balance though. You know, you want to have certainty enough to allow people to understand how the process works, whether they need to engage in the process and how, but at the same time if there is too much certainty, it's actually stifling because the regulations in the United States do not change quickly. There is, uh, even if you are moving to a process of having a final rule, there is still a certain set of requirements that has to be um, gone through. And there is, as Clay mentioned, a collaborative nature to certain types of regulations, such as these, where there are equities where everyone is not necessarily seeing the picture in the same way. So I think the regulations will likely be the key. And Treasury does post frequently asked questions like, most government agencies right now, there's a few because it's really just the legislation and there hasn't been anything else going forward, but I would look to, uh, to that as, as guidance as well. So uh, one specific thing that I think will be helpful in the future, and, and this could be 18 months from now, so just keep that in mind, is uh, they have set up a process through the legislation to create a declarations process, right? And so the declarations process is supposed to be, for lack of a, I'm just going to put it in my terms, which is going to be simple, I promise you, is a fast lane, right? We're going to submit a five page, the deals that you're talking about, we're going to submit five pages to the U.S. government and say, here's what we're thinking about doing and making an investment. Um, you good? 
and, you, and it's 30 days, and either they have to do one of a few things. One, let it go and let it keep going down the fast lane. Two, pull it over and put it into the slow lane, which means, by the way, that means you're going to have to do a full CFIUS filing, and we'll, which is worse than a proctological examination. <laughs> and, um, or they just say, you, don't, you haven't given us enough information. And so, um, so I think that that will help create a little more certainty. It probably could mean, it could mean that you're going, that CFIUS is going to be taking in all sorts of different filings, at least until, for a while, until things get sorted out. So right now, CFIUS deals with about 200 transactions a year, roughly. Um, it, this could make it go for, to, I mean, with the expansion in the authorities and this kind of declarations process, I could easily see it going to 1,000, if not more, transactions that they have to look at. But theoretically, they could be these five-page ones, as opposed to, I mean, right now, a CFIUS filing is usually about, I mean, Giovanna would know better than me, but 30, 50 pages long. Um, does it create certainty as to what will, uh, what the government will care most about and what it won't be? Not really. There are, the legislation puts some factors into it. When we did the, legis the regulations 10 years ago, we actually put out guidance on how we kind of were looking at the world. It was 10 years ago. Um, I mean, maybe Treasury will do that. They may not. They're not under any obligation to do that. Um, but I mean, that, those factors would help you. Obviously, if you're from a, a Chinese company, whether you're a government-owned little tiny company or what have you, you're always going to have a lot more scrutiny on you. You just are. I mean, whether it's uh, despite you know whether it's a black hat list or not a list, it's just going to be more scrutiny on Chinese companies for a while. Other questions? Here. You're allowed. <laughs> Make sure you identify yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Goodman uh, with CSIS. Um, I have to run to meet our keynote speaker in a second, but quickly I want to ask, a lot of people have talked about information sharing. That sounds great, but what does it actually mean? Because on the one hand, my understanding is, you know, intelligence communication, especially among allies, is already there. There's already at that level, there's intelligence sharing. On the other hand, you know, you can't share proprietary business information um, about your own companies or other companies, so other countries' companies, right? I mean, so are there's constraints on that. That's going to be challenging. So what, what actually, so best practices, what does that mean? Can people give a little more clarity to what kind of information sharing would be useful and practical? And, and let me follow up, because I had the exact same question and also wanted to hear from the lawyers on the panel because there's kind of the official response, but then part of the question here is how would the companies involved in a transaction feel about their information then being shared more, more broadly? I think it's the other side. It's not that we would be sharing information about American companies being acquired, but my understanding is when this company called Canyon Bridge was trying to acquire Lattice Semiconductors, it, it appeared like it was an American firm. It, it wasn't an American firm. It was, it, it was money funneled in. Now, I think we figured that out. Our government figured that out pretty quickly. But you could imagine uh, another case in China where you have a Chinese firm that claims it's a non-government aligned, non-government affiliated firm, just a pure market player. Uh, well, it would be really nice. Maybe the Germans have some information that we don't have that says, no, no, actually this firm got you know, $600 million from the, from the government. Or you know, another good case is a venture fund in Shenzhen. And it claims, you go to its website, it claims it is completely unaffiliated with any government except what they have a little chart there that has the Made in China 2025 little thing about what the government wants, and then it has their chart of how well they align with the Made in China 2025 thing. Yeah, that suggests they're not as independent. So I think, I think it's information like that just to be able to understand who the counterparty is. And I think speaking from the lawyer's perspective, so you are correct that within transactions, uh, part of the reason to file sometimes, because it was, it was, until it's fully effective, a voluntary process, and the committee can reach out and invite you to file, but you can still say no. Uh, so the confidentiality of the information is key. I think the critical point is, when you look at the questions that currently need to be answered for CFIUS, there's an enormous amount of information that's collected from both parties that extends well beyond what happens in the U.S. and does implicate other countries. To me, the interesting question will be, is something going to happen in the CFIUS process given the privacy regime in Europe, for example? 
or the limits on information sharing because part of the process requires, let's say, personal identifier information or corporate structures. There are certain countries that limit what information can be shared about corporate structures. I think that's where the regulations and the multi-nation exchanges will play a role in making information sharing effective. There's, first of all, there's definitely information sharing that's going on right now, thanks to WikiLeaks. Uh, we we saw that one of, the, one of the one of the uh, one of the one of the transactions that ultimately was abandoned in Canada is because the U.S. government brought to the Canadian government's attention that uh, Iran was behind the investment and that was an investment into a mine that was doing uranium. So there's certainly uh, information flow, and that flow of information that was being shared was not company information. That was information that they're that the intelligence gathering was, was undertaking. There's no doubt in my mind that they have the a jurisdiction to do that. If you take, uh, though, to your point of all the company information that's being shared, I think that's a much trickier uh, issue and obviously can talk only from the Canadian perspective. Certainly if you take a look at how the Competition Act is, uh, is dealt with, uh, which is also very similar to this foreign investment because you have governments who have to coordinate the reviews, there, our competition bureau takes the view that they can freely exchange information with other uh, agencies without a waiver, without permission, on the basis that it's furtherance of the uh, administration of their act. And so I, I have no doubt that the Investment Canada folks could take a similar uh, approach and say that. Now, the reason um, that it's interesting is that the foreign governments have historically said, well, we're not going to do that unless the parties give a waiver granting permission. And up until recently, countries didn't have national security reviews, so this has never been a real issue. My, my guess is, as time goes on, you're going to see, just like in the antitrust field, you're going to see here, you're going to see uh, com uh, companies being asked to give waivers to allow the security agencies to talk to each other, and you'll grant that. Because if you don't grant it, <laughs> you're not going to get approved. Uh, they got a pretty big hammer over you. So my guess is time goes on and Germany and, and UK and so forth have national security review uh, mechanisms. You're going to see uh, a lot of exchange between the agencies and the, and the parties will permit it. I, I, we shouldn't dismiss the sharing of an intelligence type of information because um, the legislation provides a lot more clarity for the CFIUS group. I mean, it was always like a hit or miss on whether or not you could share things because you didn't want to be held like criminally or civilly responsible, which actually is, was a possibility. That's kind of been taken away. So if Director Nishimura had come in um, and came to the Treasury and said, hey, there's a, 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 a a Canadian investor who's looking at something that's in the United States and in Japan, we'd like to kind of share a little information on that, the U.S. Treasury would tell them pound sand. And so now they would be able to have at least a little more information on that. Yeah, I think there are a lot of information we can uh, exchange. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in terms of best practice, uh, 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 mitigation ideas, uh, mitigation experiences, and also uh, actually, uh, I a uh, little bit hesitate to share a specific Japanese company's name and uh, Japanese uh, sensitive technologies uh, detail. But uh, uh, I want to exchange an uh, entity of concerns. Uh, that means uh, the uh, concerned, com uh, concerned company uh, which uh, come to Japan to uh, try to acquire a sensitive technology may go to other country to uh, try to acquire uh, similar technologies. That means uh, I, want to, I want to exchange uh, uh, concerned activities, concerned <laughs> entities, uh, the target areas, target technologies. And those kind of uh, information is, uh, I think, uh, uh, very helpful for, uh, among countries, I think. Other questions from the audience? You're waiting for the wine afterward at the reception. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a, a question at risk of opening up a whole new can of worms, but um, Chairman Henserling actually mentioned in his prepared comments the issue of um, PII, personally identifiable information, I think, yeah. um, which I'm, I'm gathering is actually one of the more sensitive issues or, or debated issues when we get into the business of, of FIRMA implementation. Um, I'm not sure quite what is the right question there. I'm looking at Rob because I feel it gets into kind of the technology 
realm and thinking about um, privacy laws and how um, PII should be treated, and that has implications, of course, for things like AI. Um, what's, what's the issue there around PII? Why is it that the chairman felt compelled to, to um, make a statement on that? Well, I believe he com felt compelled to make a statement on that, as, as he did on many other things, to argue that there shouldn't be overreach in this legislation. And we do not want, in my view, we would be ill-advised, and we just had a debate on this at ITIF this afternoon, to adopt the GDPR, the uh, General Data Privacy Protection Rule in Europe, which really makes it hard to move PII across border. So if you're a European company and you've got a facility in, in the US, uh, let's just say, you know, Audi, you probably want to have PII on your drivers come back to Stuttgart or wherever they are to be able to do AI and machine learning analytics on how well your cars work. Um, and if we go down that path of basically putting in place barriers to cross-border data flow, I think we're really going to have harm this emerging data economy. Now, maybe somebody has some data on, uh, you know, somebody who worked at the CIA or something like that, and you know, fine, I get that. But but as the chairman said, just you know, your your surfing habits or or your purchasing habits at Amazon, you know, unless you're unless you're a general or something like that, you know, even there. So we just have to be very very careful. I read that provision as being super targeted, super narrow, and I think it would be a huge mistake to widen it and open it up. If I could just comment on the, on the sensitive uh, personal information, so. Where I find it interesting is in the life sciences area. There's a lot of personal information that doesn't have to do with whether you have a security clearance or what your social security number is, but it does talk to individual DNA, might you know, certain characteristics, whether you have certain ailments, if you've participated in certain studies. And so that type of information, you know, the question becomes you might have an AI machine learning issue, but somebody wants to come in and buy a company that's doing research in a particular life sciences area where this kind of information is collected. And so does that information, even if I don't have a name per se, mm -hmm. but I have some aspect of someone's personal identifiable construct as a human being, do I suddenly have problems with can they target and you know, make diseases just that affect people with that construct? Can they find genetic weaknesses that can be targeted in different ways? I think you start to see national security and intelligence implications in those areas. And I, I think just from a personal perspective, I would find that an incredibly challenging area to allow investments without reviews. Just quickly say, what, what I didn't, uh, is you can buy an American firm uh, and you can take all their data and you can move it to God only knows where with no privacy or security rules and if you break U.S. law, you are, you are subject to, to prosecution. So this notion that we, can, we have to keep our data in our country to have, it, have U.S. law apply is just simply false. So you don't, get, a, you don't get, out of, uh, get out of jail free pass just by buying an American company and offshoring the data. And there was a good Canadian case recently where an American firm went up to Canada, branch in Canada, bought a Canadian firm, took the Canadian data down here and, and used our law, which was less stringent than Canadian law. The Canadian Privacy Authority went after them and they won the case. American firm had to pay a big fine and uh, so I just don't, I, I'm not really not that worried about that issue because the firm has to comply with U.S. law. Do you have something to say? Um, I think we're ready for our closing speaker. Um, with Assistant Secretary Tarbert from Treasury. But first, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for the discussion.
surprise there. Uh, we, thought, we thought the panel was still going on. Uh, so I'm back, Matt Goodman, uh, here at CSS. Thank you again for, um, for coming and for staying, and thanks again to our online audience. Um, we know we've got a big group based on the number of uh, hits we're getting, uh, so we, uh, we appreciate that. So um, we're now moving on to the last, well, actually, the last but one module. The last module of this event is the wine uh, out, out on the Sam Nunn Terrace, uh, and I know that'll keep you in the room. So. Um, but this will too. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Assistant Secretary uh, of the Treasury for International Markets and Investment Policy, Heath Tarbert. Um, he has uh, been in this job almost exactly a year, um, and he is in charge of CFIUS. He oversees the CFIUS process, and by now I don't have to spell out CFIUS. I think we've been through uh, that a few times. Um, he um, also, though, importantly, is in charge of multilateral development bank issues, other international organizations, uh, World Bank, Paris Club, uh, you know, G20, OECD, many other things the Treasury works on, and and a lot of that activity is is directed towards, uh, you know, advancing U.S. interests in uh, in the global economy in a in a sort of proactive and positive way. It's not all about um, defense, and um, so that is an important part of what he does. Um, um, he's also uh, serves as acting U.S. Executive Director uh, in the World Bank uh, Group, or he did, I guess. Um, that's now been permanently filled, right? Um, he served in all three branches of government, so he's got great um, um, experience um, on all sides of this issue, and he is a lawyer, uh, which, which uh, is important for this job. Uh, but we're delighted to have Assistant Secretary Tarbert with us. He's going to give a speech and, and won't be able to take questions. He has to rush back to Treasury, but we're delighted to have him with us. So please join me in welcoming Assistant Secretary Tarbert. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Matt, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here at CSIS. Uh, in prepping for my confirmation hearing, you guys had a, a, a similar session, maybe about uh, 16 months ago or so, where you, where you had a panel on, on CFIUS and CFIUS, potential CFIUS legislation. So I'm a big fan of the organization and uh, the, the, the quality of the events that you guys host are, are second to none. So I'm going to try to try to hopefully keep mine at a similar level of, of quality. I know you started off with Chairman Jeb Henserling, and I just want to let you know he was absolutely instrumental in getting the FIRMA legislation through. And FIRMA, I think is, it's been described by uh, senior members of our administration as the most um, important, largest bipartisan legislative victory of the administration. Uh, and when you look at the, the number of congressmen and senators that supported it, um, it is dramatic. Um, but now, of course, despite having that major victory, uh, the hard work of firma, firma implementation uh, is before us now. And so my job effectively, among other things, not only overviewing, seeing the current cases, is to help implement FIRMA over the next 17 months and ticking. Um, you've already talked a little bit about uh, what civious modernization is like from the business community and, and, and our foreign allies, so I thought I would give you the perspective of inside of Treasury. And before I get into the actual FIRMA legislation, I want to make something very clear. It's a point that bears emphasizing, uh, and that is that our support, support of FIRMA is not mutually exclusive with our support, our longstanding support of an open investment climate. Uh, that is something that is critically important to us. Every time I would go to the Hill and give testimony or a talk, I would always say that uh, foreign investment has been critical to U.S. economic development. Alexander Hamilton himself mentioned that in, in his famous report of manufacturers, and it continues to this day. Uh, we want to become, or sorry, we want to remain the leading destination for innovators, entrepreneurs, and other investors. Uh, we really do want to maintain that open investment environment. $7.6 trillion, that's the current stock of foreign investment in the U.S. When you look at exports that are so very important, particularly the export of goods, 23% of U.S. exports are done by companies that have a foreign parent. Um, so very important that we continue to fight for foreign direct investment, continue to encourage it. It diversifies risk. It introduces fresh and new ideas and technologies. And, and this is something that Hamilton said way back in 1791, and he used the term, and I remember it, do not be jealous of foreign investment. 
There's this idea uh, in, in some cases that foreign investment crowds out domestic investment, but, but when we look at statistics, we actually find that the opposite is true, that it actually raises net domestic capital formation when you have foreign direct investment. So it's very important, and it's something that I wanted to at least start my remarks with today, emphasizing that fact. At the same time, of course, during the last few years, it became really important that we strengthen and we modernize CFIUS. And normally when I talk to groups like this, I focus on the strengthening CFIUS side. I talk about the, the, the national security risk that we are seeing, particularly the national security risk embodied in transactions where we don't have the ability, at least until a month ago, to review. But yet, the same exact national security issues would arise. And so obviously, you, you have discussed this today in some of your panels. The new bases of jurisdiction that FIRMA has to address some of these new and emerging risk. But we didn't just strengthen FIRMA, it strengthened CFIUS and FIRMA. We also modernized it. And that was an important part of the legislative debate. It was an important part of what we tried to do at CFIUS in helping to construct the legislation was not just think about you know, addressing the risk, not just thinking about strengthening it, but also modernize it, particularly for those transactions that don't give rise to major national security concerns. We want to be able to process those quicker. And so what I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about is how CFIUS is actually modernized through Pharma and how we intend to use some of those provisions. The first and most important is that Pharma streamlines the review process for certain investments. And it does so through declarations. Now there are certain transactions where we will require declarations uh, in the statute itself for substantial interest by governmental entities uh, and potential uh, transactions involving critical technologies. But for the most part, the declaration process will be voluntary. And it's important because rather than the large 100-page uh, notice that many of you, I see a number of lawyers in the crowd, are used to filing on behalf of your clients, the declaration process is meant to be only about five pages in length. And so if we see a repeat filer from, a, from an allied country who we know, who's been through CFIUS dozens of times, uh, that's the kind of declaration, uh, that's the kind of process that we can get done within 30 days in many cases, and we don't have to go through the entire notice. And so the statute allows us to accept declarations and then within 30-day period make a decision. In some cases we might say we actually do want to see the entire notice um, because we're not familiar with the filer or the transaction potentially gives rise to national security concerns. But if all of the things are, are present and it doesn't give rise to any national security concerns on their face, we can actually re review and, and clear that transaction in 30 days based upon the five-page notice. And so that's really important uh, that I think, and we want to make greater use of that. The second thing FIRMA does in modernizing uh, CFIUS is that it changes some of the procedural rules to provide greater functionality. One of the things it does is it increases the, 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 the review period from 30 days to 45 days. Now you might say, well, that's, does that modernize it if it increases the period? Well, the answer is yes, because it provides our intelligence community more time to do their NISTA, their National Security Threat Assessment, and provides us with a little bit more room that we can clear more cases in review. Uh, as I mentioned in my congressional testimony, uh, we, in, in 10 years ago, we had about 4% of the cases going to investigation. In the last couple of years, we had something close to 70%. Now, many of those cases are because they're more complicated, because they do give rise to national security concerns. But by giving us a little extra time in the review period, my goal is to clear as many cases in review as possible. And even in the last few weeks, I've noticed that we're clearing uh, more cases in review. The other thing, so apart from the rules governing the committee and the timelines, we also now have special hiring authority. Now that may not mean too much to the private sector and to, to, to you experts in sort of international relations policies, but for us it's a huge deal. Right now we've seen cases where it's taken us, if someone leaves CFIUS, it's taken us over 400 days to get a replacement in because the government hiring process as well as the security clearance process take that long. 
And so by giving us special hiring authority, we can go out, we can hire the best and the brightest as quickly as we can and try to bring them in in an expedited fashion. And we are taking resumes, by the way. For all those of you that are US citizens uh, and have a clean background, I'll make my pitch. We are, we are looking for, for, for uh, the best and the brightest. Uh, and there is a lot of interest, obviously. We also have now a fund, a CFIUS fund, that will be created as part of FIRMA. And this allows us, essentially, to be able to move resources, financial resources, in and among the committee's members. And that's very important, because for those of you that have been before CFIUS, you know that we're often as good as our weakest link. We have 11, you know, 11 members, and all of those members need to review cases. They all need to effectively clear on the transaction, say there's no unresolved national security concerns. So we want to make sure all of them have sufficient resources. And so this is a way that we can potentially move resources around to make sure the committee as a whole is functioning effectively. And then finally, uh, and I'm particularly pleased about this, um, many of the bill's uh, provisions, particularly those that give rise to the, the, the more interesting questions that you all have discussed in your last uh, panel, uh, they go into effect only after the final rules are written, which is the sooner of 18 months or when the secretary, 30 days after the secretary publishes uh, a, a declaration saying that the rules are final and CFIUS has the resources in place. And that prevents what I would call kind of the big bang, where all of a sudden you have a very complex statute going into effect on day one without having the rules, the people, the resources in place to be able to manage it. So I think it was a very thoughtful process. So that's modernizing CFIUS. One of the other things that's, that FIRMA does, which I think is really important and, and, and is, is a common theme uh, through your conference here today, is the importance of international engagement. Uh, and we have been working very well with many of our closest allies, including Japan and Australia, who were present here today, uh, as well as the EU and the EU member states and, and several other countries as well. In fact, uh, just earlier today, I had representatives from one of our key allies in, and they were going over their new CFIUS regime and some of the legislative amendments that they had within the last couple of years. Well, why is international engagement so important? Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily something that you saw in the Exxon Florio Act of 1988. You didn't really see it that much in the, in the, in the FINSA legislation 10 years ago. But we wanted to make it part of FIRMA because there are a number of reasons why it's so important. First, there are many companies that don't have borders. I was at a law firm, for example, where we had, I think, 30, 43 offices in 33 countries, and many of our large global corporations have a similar setup. We have engineers, uh, scientists, uh, all sorts of people in different countries sharing information and sharing technological resources. That free flow of information generally fuels innovation uh, and makes uh, these companies much stronger. But uh, there are also investment security issues. So our thinking there is, well, we have to have our allies that have similar regimes to, to address that issue, the address the multinational issue. Also, supply chains. Our government, our military, many of you are far more experts on this subject than me, but our, our supply chains for government procurement uh, often have, have components, some of which are made, out, number of which are made outside the United States. And in some cases, we have companies that are based in America that, that, re that source their components outside the United States. So the fact that we have supply chains that span, span, in many cases, many countries mean that we also need to have an investment security regime that, that fits the new world that we have in the 21st century. And then finally, there is a national security reality. And that's simply this. Let's just suppose there's, there's some kind of critical technology that if a strategic competitor of the United States got, it would set us back five, 10 years from a national defense perspective. And let's suppose that technology exists in Silicon Valley. But let's also suppose it exists somewhere in Europe. Well, it doesn't really matter where our potential uh, strategic competitor gets that technology, does it, from a national security perspective. It's the fact that they have it that is the national security risk. Uh, 
So in that respect, when you think about all of what we're doing with NATO and other security allowances, alliances, it just simply makes sense that for investment security, we have a similar regime. So we're working very closely with our allies, and FIRMA, of course, provides some incentives, as some of you discussed, to get our allies to continue to work with us to creating those regimes. I want to turn back domestically just for a moment before I conclude, just to give you a little sense of, again, what we're doing inside of Treasury. We are now in the process of going through the legislation and thinking about putting out the rules. And so that process will take anywhere. It, we, we're about a month out from FIRMA, about six weeks out from FIRMA now, 10 to 16 months to, to implement the final regulations. And obviously, we would issue uh, notice and comment rulemaking proposed rules prior to the end of that 18-month period that started back in August. So we very much look forward to public comment, uh, all of you, your input on those rules when they're proposed. And even beforehand, if you want to send us ideas, uh, we're, we're always uh, interested in taking them. Also internally, I am working with my team to build out the modern-day CFIUS. So we're hiring new staff. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, we're hiring new staff. And we've also internally, for those of you that work with us, have changed our, our organizational structure. We used to just be one office in Treasury that was called the Office of Investment Security. And just a few weeks ago, we created three new offices. First, we have the Office of Reviews and Investigations. And that's the office that will process all of the cases. That will probably have the bulk of our employees, uh, and the case officers, and the senior case officers. Second, we have the Office of Policy and International Engagement. That will be the office that, that is writing the rules, that is, that, is, that is drafting the regulations, and also the office that is keeping in touch with many of our foreign counterparts, understanding their regulatory regimes, and also reaching out in particular cases uh, where we may want to share information. And then finally, we, we have an office of mitigation, monitoring, and enforcement. And that office basically does everything else, monitoring, the idea there is that the office is going to be out on the lookout for non-notified transactions. These are transactions that haven't been filed with CFIUS, but nonetheless are, are subject to CFIUS's jurisdiction, so we can determine whether or not there's something we need to look at. And if that's the case, then we can either invite the parties to the transaction to file, or uh, we can actually file an agency notice uh, bringing the transaction in. The other thing the office will do is mitigation agreements. Uh, but both reviewing mitigation agreements, but also after the transaction is done, ensuring that those mitigation agreements are complied with, and if they're not complied with, the office will have an enforcement function. So as CFIUS grows, we will grow with it in terms of our organizational structure. So there are many changes on the horizon. Uh, we're excited to begin the process of FIRMA implementation, and we very much look forward to working with all of you in doing so. Thank you very much.